I have a growing list of life aspirations, uh, things I would like to accomplish in my life, and one of those is to rob a bank. <laughs> Not really, but I've always wanted to say that in a sermon, so I can check that off the list. Uh, no, but I really love a good heist movie. Mary and I love heist movies. When you have a, a gang of ragtag individuals with amazing technical skills, but they perhaps chose the wrong path in life. But their goal is to go into the most secure area and take something that technically is impossible to take. And so I, I love it. You always are rooting for these guys. And you're like, why am I rooting for them? But they have to get into the safe. And so they, they have these tools. And I, 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 we were watching one this week. And they, they like drilled into the safe. And they got the, the stethoscope out. And they're, they're listening for the combination as they go. And they're like clicking. And I have no idea what they're listening for. But I, it's, it's like part of my dream in life to, to be a safe cracker bank robber, okay? Uh, I know I'm not supposed to say that, but uh, it, it's, it's amusing. I, I, love, I love watching this happen because they've got all these skills and, and they're listening and they're doing what is technically impossible to open the safe. I think sometimes... We kind of feel like prayers like that. That, that you, you, you have to have the right skills. You have to know what to listen for. And you have to have the right technical expertise to open the safe, to make it work. And for some of us, prayer is awkward. It's hard, and we, we don't quite know how to do it. We don't know what tools to use, what to listen for. And we feel like it's this mysterious safe to be cracked and we'll leave it to the experts. But this morning I'd like to encourage us to think deeply about prayer. That prayer isn't a technical skill, but it's a personal invitation. Now, prayer is not like cracking a safe where you have to make the right movements or listen for the right things in order to make it work. In fact, I'd like us to lay down the idea this morning that prayer is something that works. I know we hear this. We hear it in culture. We hear it in, in Christian circles. We hear it in our churches that prayer works. But I'd like to propose this morning an alternative that God works and prayer matters. A prayer is not something that is technical that we have to do right. But it is something that is personal that we have to do genuinely. Now, I don't want you to feel guilty about prayer this morning. I realize that when we start talking about prayer, many of us have this overwhelming sense of guilt that surfaces. Uh, it's that feeling that we don't do enough. Uh, perhaps that our prayer life isn't what we want it to be. Uh, this morning, we're continuing a series that I've called Healthy Habits, Intentional Steps to Growing in Jesus. And the last thing that I want for us as we go for, through this series is for you to feel guilty and shameful about your habits, about uh, these things that we're talking about. Because let me tell you this this morning, I believe that guilt and shame are never a catalyst for spiritual growth. Sure, guilt and shame are sometimes things that we feel because of sin in our lives and they lead us back to Jesus, but they never move us to spiritual growth. Uh, we read in Romans 8, chapter, ver, chapter 8, verse 1, that there is therefore no condemnation, no guilt for those who are in Christ Jesus. And for us to really take in these healthy habits, my goal for us is that you wouldn't feel guilty this morning about prayer, that you wouldn't feel guilty about what we looked at in rest or meditating on God's word, but that you would feel hunger and thirst and a longing for what God is inviting us 
into. He's inviting us to grow. And one of the, the gifts that God gives us is this thing that we call prayer. Now, I mentioned that many of us view prayer as like this technical thing that we don't know the right words to say to make it work right, but it's not quite like that because the passage that we started our service with this morning in Hebrews uh, chapter uh, 4 uh, describes the reality that we have a great high priest. And that is Jesus who has gone into the presence of God and he, he knew the combination. You see, there was a time when prayer in the nation of Israel what felt a bit technical. God had given all these commands. This is how you're supposed to approach me. And if you don't come through these avenues, then you will surely die. Like the, 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 the stakes were huge for the nation of Israel when it came to prayer. And so what we have when Jesus enters the scene and the disciples say, Lord, teach us, teach us how to pray. And Jesus starts with our Father. That was a game changer. Because it was no longer about what was technical, but it became personal. It became about a relationship of a child to the Father. And Fatima, if you put that Hebrews passage up on the screen, it says that Jesus entered, that he ascended into heaven, and he's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, yet he did not sin. He says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. What this is saying is that Jesus took the technical out of the picture and he cracked the safe, I think he did, and uh, he, he knew how to open it. i got to figure out what the combination is to this thing. But Jesus knew how to open the safe. And Jesus broke open what was once technical and made it personal. And prayer becomes an invitation to us. So this morning, I'd like us to briefly look at a passage of Scripture in which we have a command to pray. It's a, it's a passage that I hope will help us to lay down our preconceived notions about prayer. And we can ask this morning, as the disciples asked Jesus in Luke 11, Lord, teach us how to pray. Uh, the passage is 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. Does anybody ever wish to do God's will for their life? Yeah, uh, me too. I, I, there are seasons where I'm just like, God, I just wish I knew what you wanted for me in life. Well, actually, this is a passage of Scripture that tells us very directly what God's will for your life is. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, and then get this, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There we go. A plain and simple, we have a command here to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There's three things that we have here in this passage, and we're just going to consider this briefly as we think about what prayer is. He starts with rejoice always. Now notice that rejoicing is about delight. And last week we looked at the spiritual discipline of meditating on God's word. And we saw in Psalm 1 that meditating on God's word starts with delighting in God's word. And, and, and one of the things that I hope we can see as we go through these spiritual habits, these spiritual disciplines, these tools that God gives us to grow in our walk with Jesus is that it's not about duty, it's about delight. Prayer isn't about duty, it's about delight. Uh, delighting always. Rejoice always. I hear those words and I say, that's hard. 
Because there are seasons of our lives where it's hard to be joyful. There are circumstances that will arise this week in your family, in your home, in your workplace, where those words, rejoice always, will feel hard. The command of Paul to the church in Thessalonica is to rejoice always. Now, I want us to step back from this and ask, what does it mean to rejoice? Well, well joy is something that's far different, as, as the scriptures describe rejoicing, it's far different than happiness. Because James says in James chapter 1, rejoice, my brothers, when you face all kinds of happy things. No, he says, when you face all kinds of fiery trials, rejoice. Joy is not dependent on our circumstances, but joy is a delight in God despite our circumstances. And I want to encourage us to think about prayer as a means of finding delight in the reality that God is at work. God is still at work in your life in those hard things. The church in Thessalonica knew the realities. When they would have gotten this letter from Paul and it said rejoice always, they were walking through persecution. It was the early days of the establishment of the church and the church was being, uh, people were being put to death because of their stance of faith and Paul's telling them rejoice always? Are you kidding me? But what Paul is pointing us to is the reality that finding our delight in God is not something that's dependent on circumstances, and prayer is an avenue that helps us do that. I'm not saying that we are always going to be like, oh, I am so delighted in God, and that I, I, I'm just going to have a smile on my face. No, delight in its deepest form of joy is a sense of contentment, no matter what's happening in life. And what prayer invites us to do, as it go, he goes on, he says, pray continually. We, we, we see rejoice always is delight. Pray continually is an attitude of dependence. Paul is not saying you need to stop working, you need to stop uh, eating, and just be on your knees 24-7 and pray. No, what Paul is pointing us to when he says pray continually is he is inviting us into an attitude of dependence on God. This, this kind of continual prayer, uh, some of our translations of this may uh, say pray without ceasing, uh, now, for many of us, the goal is to pray without snoozing, you know? Uh, but pray without ceasing, it's, it's not about the time of prayer. It's about the attitude of prayer. And so, often, what we have in our minds that prayer is, is inviting God to come do what we want him to do in this world. I mean, we have things in our lives that we would like to see change, whether it's sickness, whether it's challenges, and, and, and often we approach prayer as this inviting God to do what we want him to do. And I'd like for us to step back and consider that prayer is God's invitation to us to be involved in what he's already doing. And God is inviting you and me to be involved in his continued work in the world today. And yes, I want us to be bold before God with our requests. He is, Jesus is clear all throughout the Gospels. I want you to come to me like a child comes to his parents. Now, and most children, when they come to their parents, they don't have a filter with what they ask for. Now, if you go to your boss and you want to ask for a raise, you probably think through how you're going to say that. But a child goes to their parents and says, I want a popsicle. I mean, the, the reality is there's no filter there. And that 
all throughout the Gospels, that is the picture that when, whenever we're given Jesus talking about prayer, he's always going back to children. Because they don't put a filter, they don't have the technical words to say, they simply bring their request before God. And so I'm encouraging us that that is a lot of what prayer is, is to be. And I want us to lay down the idea that we have to do it right. That we have to pray the right way or say the right words or else prayer won't work or God won't answer. No, God knows our hearts already. He already knows what you're thinking, what your heart is feeling. And so he wants you to be honest. And I encourage you, one of the best ways to learn to pray with honesty is to pray the Psalms. The Psalms are a book of the Bible that are, in many ways, uh, 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 prayers of honesty. There are many Psalms that start with, God, I need you, I am struggling right now. There are even psalms that say, surely God is good, but as for me, I'm struggling with that reality right now. The psalms enable us to bring an absolute honesty before our Father who invites us simply to come with our request, who isn't going to scold you because of the burdens you bring. He isn't going to reject your prayer because you didn't pray it right. God wants your heart. And so this invitation to pray continually, I don't want it to feel daunting, but I want it to feel like an invitation by God to be involved in what he's already doing. And we pray boldly for him to do things in our lives, to bring healing, to bring restoration, to, to bring uh, someone back to him. We, we pray boldly and persistently, but we pray with this, with this belief that God is at work and prayer is an invitation to us to be involved in that work. It's not that prayer works. It's that God works. And prayer matters. Pray continually is a dependence upon God. And I would encourage you that this is something that is both spontaneous throughout your day. Just stopping, slipping away. We see a picture of Jesus in the Gospels. He, he slips away in Luke chapter 6 and he slips away from his disciples. He goes on a, out on a mountain and has time to pray. It, it's, it's spontaneous, but it's also something that's, that's structured. It's 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 systematic. I would encourage you that praying continually is something that becomes a spontaneous sentence prayer here and there, but it doesn't happen with us being systematic about setting aside time for it. And so some of us, as we think about prayer, I, I don't want you to feel guilty about, uh, about the time that you spend in prayer, but I want you to feel hungry for setting aside, maybe it's five, ten minutes on your lunch break, or uh, when you get home in the evening, where you're just going to say, I am just going to stop. And I'm going to realize and remind myself of the truth that God is inviting me to be involved in what he is doing, this continued work of restoration in this world, and I am going to express my dependence upon him. We'll bring our requests before him. And so it's both spontaneous and structured. And this final command, give thanks in all circumstances. It takes me back to rejoice always. It's, it's this, it doesn't have a stop. And gratitude becomes the attitude of prayer. And what, 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 what happens when we start to develop this habit of prayer this habit of dependence upon God, we'll find that the, the direction of our hearts and our minds changes. The direction changes from inward to upward. We start to be thankful because God is with us, that he has invited us to be part of what he's doing. And this give thanks in all circumstances is, is a perspective changer. 
And prayer is able to do that. If we develop healthy habits of spending time with Jesus, of expressing our dependence upon him, and bringing our requests before him, we will find that the direction of our hearts and our minds goes upward instead of inward because the opposite of gratitude, I want us to think about this for a moment, what's the opposite of gratitude? It's one of two things. It's either discontent or pride. The opposite of gratitude is either discontent, we aren't happy with what we have, with what's happening in life, or we're prideful that we accomplished what's happening in life. And the attitude of prayer turns us from inward to upward. It says, I am grateful that God has invited me to be part of what he's doing in the world, and I have no clue what it is in this circumstance but I'm grateful, I'm thankful, and I can rejoice, I can find my delight in that, I can find my dependence on God in that, and I can change the direction of my heart and my mind in this circumstance. When I was 12, I got a boom box for my birthday, and uh, it was a CD player, and uh, just kind of that classic boom bops that I had in my room and I play music on it and I had like one CD that I put in there and uh, it had a little button on it. In fact, I got a picture of the front of a, a stereo here. Notice number three on the stereo. Notice what, what's, what's on the number three? RPT. What's it mean? Repeat. I, I would press that button a lot. I had some favorite songs and I would put songs on repeat. Um, and I just listened to it over and over and over. You want to know God's will for you? I want you to remember this. RPT, repeat this. Rejoice always. Pray continually. And give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God for you. And when we do this, we develop this habit. This habit of prayer where it's not about this technical skill to break the safe of God at work. It's simply us depending upon God. He's inviting you. He's inviting me to be part of this. I remember when I was, I was a high schooler and I, I was listening to the radio and there was a preacher on. And... Uh, the, the preacher was preaching on Acts chapter 12, verse 5, and I vividly remember this message where, where the preacher said, uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 5 says, uh, but Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. And I was struck with this reality that prayer matters. But it's God who works. You know what? God came in in Acts chapter 12, set Peter free from prison. He shows up at the door of the church where they are praying. And the, the servant door girl opens the door and looks out. And she sees Peter. And they've just been praying for Peter in prison. And, and she shuts the door. She runs back inside. She says, hey, is Peter outside? They said, you're crazy. But prayer matters. And God works. I don't know what you've been praying for. Some of you may have prayers that you've been praying for for years. Jesus invites you to keep praying. Not because it's a magical formula, but because he's inviting you to be involved in the process of what he's doing in the world today. You see, the practice of prayer is an ongoing conversation of dependence on God, a delight in His presence, and a deep gratitude that He has invited us to be involved in what He is doing in the world today. I'll be honest with you this morning. Uh, Mary had a rough morning this morning. She was coughing. Her lungs were having trouble getting up. and I was standing there catching her vomit. And I said, I don't know how to live out this passage right now. How do I rejoice in this? How do I delight in God? In that, in that moment, I had this overwhelming sense that it wasn't just the two of us in the room. But God was with us. And that was all I needed to find my delight in Him. It didn't change the circumstances. 
It simply gave me a dependence and a delight and a gratitude that he's invited me to be involved in what he's doing in the world. And he's with us. And it would be a disservice this morning for me to close this sermon and simply talk about prayer. So we're going to pray. Um, we're going to close this time in a time of prayer. Um, I'm, I'm going to be quiet. I've done enough talking this morning. And I invite you to talk with Jesus. You don't have to say the right things. In fact, there's no right thing for you to say. He just simply wants you to come to him. Like a child comes to his parents. Say, God, I need you. If you don't know what to pray, crack open the book of Psalms. Maybe Psalm 23, that passage, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. I encourage you, take some time, talk with Jesus this morning and ask him, how can I create a pattern, a healthy habit of delighting in you, depending on you, and directing my eyes and my heart in gratitude to you. Let's pray together.